Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. Come on, let's give our hands together. Testimony from death to life. The grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, oh, Jesus. Come on, let's make you give up again to Jesus. We praise you this morning. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be worshipped, Jesus. We magnify your name. Oh, you are worthy, Jesus.
Come on, let's just sing a little bit. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Let's give him praise. Let's give him worship. 
Let's give him honor, glory, power, majesty. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Say those words. We love you, Jesus. We adore you, Jesus. We magnify you, Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's great to have you with us in church this morning. We've got some new faces. Welcome to church. I'm Pastor Shane. Uh, we've got Pastor Beck here. We've got our team here. So we're in for a good day today. We've got Creation Ministries with us. So it's great to have you with us. So we're going to pray this morning. It's good to have you with us. And I wanted to uh, pray and declare a promise over you and our church and our families and our community. And this is a, a really good thing to pray. And in light of what we're going to do here today, believe strongly that this is going to fit the morning. Uh, God wants to do something amazing in your life, doesn't he? Amen. Watching church online, God wants to do something great in your life. And Isaiah 60 says this, Arise, shine. Arise, shine. He's calling you and I to arise and to shine. For your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Amen. If you're saved, if you're born again, then God's light has risen, is shining upon you this morning. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. But we don't focus on the darkness and deep darkness, the people. We see darkness over people, but God's light is much bigger and greater. But the Lord will arise over you. I want you to believe that this morning. God's light will arise over you. And His glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. And then you shall see and become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy. We're going to pray that the goodness and the love of God fills you to overflowing and that we win people to Jesus Christ. People get saved, they get healed, deliver. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning. I thank you, you're a good God. I thank you, Lord, that we're calling Christians to arise and to shine for the glory of the Lord has risen, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord, an abundance of joy just sweep over our church this morning, that sweep over our mums and dads and grandparents and all of our relatives, that when we go into the workplace, our joy goes before us, our hope, our peace, our love goes before us. And as we prepare our hearts for this next song, that we believe that God can do bigger and greater things than, than what we hope or thought or dreamed of this morning. Father, we declare, Lord, that love loans will come back into the loving relationship with Jesus Christ. We declare that signs and wonders shall follow those who believe. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that we shall let our light shine, even though that there is a bit of darkness covering people on the earth, that as Christians we raise up and we rise up, Lord, in Jesus' name, for our light, our light to flood the earth with the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Come and touch us as we worship you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes will not perish they shall have it said. 
Father, we praise you, we honor you. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. Thank you, Father. We worship you in this place. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's time to give this morning. Uh, just take your seat. Take your seat as we sit in the presence of the Lord. Wonderful worship, wonderful presence in the house this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Bula Bula Vinaka Malachi, Malachi 3, 10 to uh, 12. Bible reads, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord right. Almighty. Yeah. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room enough to store it. Yeah. I will prevent covid sickness, death from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe says the Lord one of the, uh, the part of the scripture I want to highlight is the Lord says test me in this giving is, giving is, a, uh, is a principle it's a very good strong principle especially in our walk in faith, in our walk with God. I have a, I have a couple of people in my life, they're Christians, <clears throat> strong Christians. They go to church, they go to church, and I have conversations, come up with conversations with them, and they, some of them don't have a good relationship in giving. They, some of them don't even believe in giving, tithing. And this is what I tell them. Just my own experience and revelation of giving because it is a uh, principle. This is what I tell them. Don't tell me you love God if you don't love giving <laughs> to him. I mean, you cannot tell me you love your wife or your children if you uh, don't love giving to them. All right? And you can't tell me you, you love God if you don't love your family. Because the Bible says if you, if you don't love the one that you see, how can you love someone you do not see? So, in, in this, in this I, believe, I believe some of us might still struggle with the, the fact that we have to give, the truth that we have to give. Before giving goes into the ministry to help in the community, our church ties to the, the, national, uh, the national movement, by the way, and that national ties into the international. So it reaches the whole world to bless other people out there that are lost. But before that, <clears throat> before that, as you give, you're giving to the very heart of God. Yes. You know, it's between you and God. It's been, it's your heart with God. So as we give this morning, whenever you give, have that expectation that you're giving to God and he is ready to bless you, yes. bless your children, their children, and their children. Yes. Awesome. He is, we cannot outgive God. So I want to I end, end with this. And these friends of mine, these people that are part of my life that struggle with giving, some of them don't even believe in giving. This is what I tell them. Don't let your children and their children, your grandchildren, miss out on the blessings of God just because you choose or you refuse to give to God. So... Giving is important. It's yeah. part of our lives. And if you haven't experienced your testimony, you haven't had the testimony of giving, God says in his word, test me in this. And he's going to show you. Yeah, so if you don't believe in giving, test God in this. He says it himself. Yeah. Test him and see what he's going to do. So we're going to give this morning. Just close your eyes with me. Father, we, yeah, so. we thank you for the heart to give that as we grow, Father, in our faith, 
that we should not miss out in this principle, this key, Father. <clears throat> There's, as a song says, Father, that prayer is the door to heaven, but key that unlocks the door is faith, our giving, because we give to you, Father. So we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this time. Those that are here, that are or people that are part of our lives, that haven't experienced your blessing, Father. Let this be a moment as we give, Father. We know that we're giving to you, to your very heart, as you bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Shane. Amen. Thank you, Simi. Thank you so much. Uh, we get doing announcements this morning. I also wanted to encourage you just quickly that, uh, as you know, most of us know that we have Creation Ministries International with us. So a big warm welcome from my wife and I and our team. So that's really exciting. Uh, also, in, in line with your giving, if you wanted to uh, give online to, to Creation Ministries, we are taking up an offering towards that. Uh, there's about nine of these circulating all around the world. So it, it didn't take an hour to build or two hours. And I don't think any of these bu were built during COVID, were they? So there, there's an extra amount of energy that has gone into building these because during COVID we had a bit of extra time to do this. And this was non-COVID building. And so I want to encourage you to uh, get on our timely uh, and get on our internet website and give $10, $20, $30, $50, whatever you feel in your heart to give, we're taking up an offering for Creation Ministry. So I encourage you to do that today. And I hand over to my beautiful wife. And a big, uh, again, extended warm welcome to all of our visitors and friends and families that don't normally fellowship with us. Great to have you with us. So good. Can we give them a clap this morning? Thank you. Welcome to Westgate Church. It is so wonderful to have you here and a special warm welcome if you are here for the first time. Uh, we'd love you to stay and join us after the service. We've got lots going on outside. We have got delicious hot soup and uh, all sorts of things to eat. Uh, we'd love to get to know you. Uh, there's great resources for children and for adults and of course uh, the ark you can have a look at the outside as well. I just wanted to mention with our children today, uh, we do have activities for them down in our kids' church room. So anyone that wants to come and go, we are just happy for you to quietly come and go as you need. The church service will be a bit longer today. So uh, they're doing some of their own Noah's Ark activities down there. So please feel free to uh, come and see me if you need to know where to go and come up and down as you need to. That's totally fine. Okay, so we've got a few things coming up for the men. You have got your once a month or so uh, men's night on the 2nd of July. And uh, it's going to be exciting at 6.30. Pastor Phil Cutcliffe is actually coming to share and he's going to be amazing. So there's a light supper included. So please see Thomas if you'd like to know more about that. All right, we have our next ladies living room coming up as well. And that will be in July. So 16th of July. So you can start looking and putting that one into your calendar as well. Our next Connect Sunday is at the end of this month. So once a month, last Sunday of the month, we have our special Connect Sunday. So don't miss on that one. Actually, there's a really special one coming up. And that is our Christmas in July. Now we have flyers outside. We want you all to come for our Christmas in July to the end of July. And Pastor Shane is cooking roast dinner for us, roast lunch. So it's going to be fantastic. Please see Ali and she's starting to collect a list of what you can bring for that. We had a great youth group break up Friday night. We had an amazing mini Olympics. I want us to thank Pat for all his hard work. It was so great. <laughs> and our winning team this year was the Netherlands. And uh, so their youth is on a three-week break. So if you want to know about a great youth group, come and have a chat to me later on. All right. Uh, SWB Ladies Conference is coming up, so please make sure you have registered for that. We also have a bonfire to advertise. So Pastor Dawn does great bonfires in winter, and we're having one on the 24th of July. So if you'd like to put that one in your diary, we'd love to have you all here. All right. The last thing I wanted to say is... Um, Alyssa and Simi are very, very close to having their little bum. So can you just turn around and reach your hand out? We're just going to pray for them as they go through their new journey together. 
Father God, I just thank you for this amazing couple, Lord, and this exciting time that is coming up very, very soon in their life. And I just thank you for your hand around them, your protection, Lord, the angels are surrounding them. I just thank you for a perfect little girl, Lord, and uh, that Lisa just goes through this journey with such strength and grace in Jesus' name. Thank you for favour and blessing right now. Amen. Amen. And please uh, see us as to how you can support them with meals. We'd love to get around and be a big support in the next couple of weeks. So thank you so much. We're just going to go on to communion now. But as I said, kids, feel free to come and go as you need to this morning. All right. Thank you so much, Rose. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Amen. (laughs) This is a wonderful time. We're going to move quite quickly. We're going through communion. So as the communion is given out, let's just turn our hearts to the Lord. This is why we're here. Amen. We are here because of the blood of Jesus Christ that died for you, died for you, died for you individually. He loves you and he wants you to have the best that he has provided for. And so as we look at our scripture verse today, we're just going to read from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26, New King James Version. And this is Paul talking to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We can take communion at home. We can take communion with friends, with loved ones, in other meetings and in other places. It's very important that we remind ourselves of what Christ did on the cross and he was resurrected. We must remind ourselves very much, (laughs) that he bore our sicknesses and diseases on the cross. It says in Isaiah 53, it was prophesied. And by his stripes, you were healed. You were delivered. You were, salvation was paid for all mankind. And we must remind ourselves constantly. And we do it as a covenant to him, as a reminder. So let's stand up. Let's take our cup and take our bread. And realise that this is a symbol of what Christ did for you and for me. If you are born again today, you know him as your own Lord and Saviour, personal Saviour. Check yourself. The Bible says that we should check ourselves before we have communion. Is there anything in us? Is there anything like unforgiveness and bitterness and hatred? These are all horrible words, aren't they? But we can have them simmering in the background. Let's clean our hearts as we approach the King of Kings. Let's clean our hearts and our minds and our words and our mouth. Amen. And let's rejoice in the God of our salvation. Let's drink together. We'll just quickly pray. We thank you, Father, for all your wonderful mercies and blessings to us. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much and you care about everything we do and everything we say. You are intricately involved in our lives and we bless you and honour you today as a family covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen. That's great. This is very exciting. Uh, thank you, Rod and uh, Nancy. Thank you so much. So much to remember. My apologies. So uh, I'm not the only one, okay? So just ease up. So Rod and Nancy, Creation Ministries International. So good to have you with us. 
Uh, this is going to go a little bit longer than we normally preach, but that's a good thing because you guys love truth, you love the Word of God, and you've come here to learn something new. So I believe this is going to fly because we're going to have so much fun, aren't we? So much fun. We're going to learn so much. So we're excited to have you with us today. So uh, you're going to stand there. You're going to stand in front. You're going to stand up where I am. Come on up. Welcome. Welcome. Let's give our appreciation. Thanks so much. Great to have you with us. Good, thanks. Good to be here, Shay. Okay, everybody hear that up the back? Okay, well, folks, uh, can you see that? Okay, well, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, I just get it nearly right, that'll do. Okay. Okay, well, before I start the talk, folks, I, I always like to mention our freebies. Any, anybody here like freebies? Well, we've got lots of freebies up the front, folks. I've got some postcards, uh, leaflets, little Bibles. Make sure that you grab some of those and take them with you, then pass them on. Amen? Another one of our freebies is our website. Anybody familiar with the website? Folks, amazing website. Over 12,000 fully searchable articles, and it's so easy to remember. Creation.com. Amen? Well, another one of our freebies are Info Bites. Now, by the way, these, are, these keep us up to date with the creation-evolution debate. You know, there's always some controversy happening. Is that true with creation and evolution? Who'd like to be the first to know if something interesting is happening? Well, all you need to do, folks, is fill in your email details on one of these clipboards, and Nancy's going to pass around. And uh, it's, remember, it's a free service. You don't have to pay for this at all. Now, while that's happening, <coughs> folks, I want to give you a, a very quick testimony. Why would I build a model of Noah's Ark? Well, I've built nine of them so far. But, you know, as a child, I was a prolific model builder, but only between the age of seven and ten. Now, in those days, there were no kits like today. Mum would buy me the raw material. I'd design heaps of aeroplanes and boats. But after the age of ten, I never built another model till April 1997. Now, I happened to be in bed with a crook back. Anybody ever had a crook back? Well, my back was pretty bad, as it turned out. In fact, I was in bed for four days. On well, the first day, I'm wondering what I should do. Well, I started to read the Bible from the very beginning in Genesis. Because when I got to the account of Noah, God just illuminated the whole thing. He said, Rod, build a model of Noah's ark. Well, I thought my back's gone. Now my head's gone. But I knew it was God, folks. In fact, the next day, <coughs> I've already scaled it down. I've sketched it out. And then God confirmed it. God said, turn the radio on. Folks, for the next 20 minutes, they're talking about Noah's Ark, but they were mocking it, laughing. Who believed in Noah's Ark in this scientific age? God said, see what I mean? Build a model. He said, when you finish the model, people will come to you and ask questions, and you'll just answer their questions, folks. Well, the model was finished, folks. This is what you can do if you don't watch TV for seven months. Yes, three hours a day, 200 days, 600 hours work went into building that model. Anyway, the model was finished, uh, <coughs> like I say, and then... Nothing happened for a few weeks in January 1998, two days before a, a huge uh, boating festival in Geelong. Now, this is a, a big, big event. Thousands come from all over Australia. <coughs> Excuse me. But two days before, well, you don't normally turn up with two days' notice at these events. You've got to book months in advance. Anyway, I found out who the organiser was. I got on the phone. I said, look, remember it's a boating festival. I said, look, I've got a model of the oldest boat on record. Would you be interested? Folks, they gave me the best spot. I'm not kidding. We, Nancy and I never sat down for three days. We had half a dozen, 15, 20 people firing questions for three days. From there, we got invited to schools and churches and country shows. In fact, before we come on board with Creation Ministries, do you know we went to 600 venues part-time? I was still working around Australia. I never organised one. Wow. So if you've got a problem in my talk tonight, today I should say, don't forget it wasn't my idea. But I want you to be a, a good Berean and check it out. Amen? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now, we need Nancy back, then. <clears throat> Just leave them, now. I get very thirsty talking about the flood, so <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll just have a little drink now and again. Okay. Well, folks, let's... Uh, Let's have a look at this little ch children's storybook. Anybody ever seen one of those? Yeah. What does everybody say? How would all the animals fit on Noah's Ark? Yeah. 
Folks, when you grow up with that sort of thing in your head, look what happens. He's a newspaper man. He's telling four million people in Melbourne that's what Noah's Ark looked like. Well, that's just a fraction of the size of the real Noah's Ark. I tell you what, it certainly doesn't show the skill and craftsmanship of ancient people. But today we're going to show you what it really looked like, how big it was, and lots of interesting things as well. In fact, you know, most people don't realise this, but Noah's Ark and the Genesis Flood is one of the three major events that ever happened in the whole world. Number one, of course, was creation. Is that true? Yes. Folks, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? Yes. Okay. Number two was a worldwide flood of Noah. And number three was a coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Yes. Folks, here we see the great love of God when our Creator actually became our Saviour. Yes. See, in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 3, it says, it says about Jesus that nothing was made that hasn't been made unless it was made by Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen? Amen? Folks, Jesus wasn't just a, a prophet. He was a creator of the whole universe. In fact, folks, turning water into wine wasn't the first miracle of Jesus Christ. The first miracle of Jesus Christ was the creation of the whole universe. Now, it's very sadly, all these three ma major events have been maligned by unbelievers, not only outside the church, sometimes from within. In fact, the Apostle Peter writes pro prophetically in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, and he tells us that in the days we're living in, folks, many people will be willingly ignorant. Yes, they'll purposely ignore two things. One, God is creator. I mean, how many people in the world today think that everything just happened by random chance without a designer? And two, the historical fact of a worldwide flood. Folks, a lot of people think it was just a myth, a children's story, a local flood. They don't take it seriously as they should. But today I want to encourage us that we can actually trust in God's word from the very first verse in the Bible. Who'd like to do that today? Yeah. And by the way, without any compromise whatsoever. Well, why did God send the flood? Remember in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible tells us we are created special in the image of God. Who believes that today? Yeah. Folks, we are different. We're distinct from the rest of the animal kingdom. Amen. In the beginning, everything was very good, not just good. The Bible said it was very good. There was no death, sickness or violence. Adam and Eve and all the animals ate fruit, nuts and veggies. A beautiful paradise it was. Well, what happened to destroy that paradise? Well, folks, Adam and Eve, they rebelled against God. Because of their sin and rebellion, folks, we now live in a cursed world. Thorns and thistles. And, of course, uh, it's no longer perfect. But the Bible makes it clear, there was no death before the sin of Adam. Anyway, later on, Cain killed Abel, then Lemek killed a young man. 1,500 years later, we come to the days of Noah and the flood, when Noah was 500 years old and just middle-aged. Yeah. Who'd like to be 500 and middle-aged? <laughs> yeah, but I don't mean a worn-out old man. I mean fit in a 35-year-old. Folks, I go into primary school sometimes, get all the little kids up the front and say, who's got a grandpa, 500 years old? Should see the hands go up, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. But you know, when God created Adam, folks, he was created to live forever. Is that true? Yeah. She eventually died at 930 because of sin. Anyway, Noah is now the father of Shem, Ham and Japheth. This particular time is a tremendous increase in population, but sadly, a great increase in wickedness. Remember how good it was in the beginning? Folks, listen to what it says in Genesis 6, 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination, folks, every thought of the heart was evil continually. Tell me, who believes we need to be very careful what we watch on TV or read in magazines? Folks, you only need to watch a bad TV show. Your mind's thinking bad things. Is that true? Yeah. And, of course, in uh, Philippians 4, verse 8, it gives a bit of advice, doesn't it? It tells us, of course, to set our mind on things that are good, things that are true, things that are honest, and things that are pure. Anyway, God confided in Noah, told him because of all the violence and the evil going on, he's going to bring a great flood to cover the whole world. And so God gave Noah detailed instructions on building the ark. Of course, a lot of people would say, how could ancient people build such a massive structure? Well, folks, they never read the Bible. Who thinks it's a good idea to read the Bible? Amen. Anybody heard of Tubal Cain? Folks, 1,000 years before Noah built the ark, Tubal Cain was an expert in making tools out of iron and bronze. Also, 1,000 years before Noah built the ark, Jubal was an expert in making musical instruments. 
You see, folks, ancient people are incredibly intelligent. We only need to look at the great buildings in Rome and Greece, etc. They're still standing today. Nancy and I went to over and saw the uh, Colosseum in 2016. What an amazing building built 2,000 years ago. But what about the pyramids? Do you think they're pretty incredible? Folks, do you know the original capping stones under those pyramids? There were thousands of them. Do you know they weighed two and a half tons each? The tolerance between those stones? 0.25 of a millimetre. Wow. Tell me, how did they do that? Well, nobody's figured it out yet, folks. You know, Nancy and I, we drive all over Australia. Some of the outback towns are a bit shabby. Look at this great example of Australian workmanship. What do you think of that? <laughs> huh? But seriously, folks, the ancient Mayans were brilliant in mathematics. Did you know that? Do you know they had a calendar accurate to point zero 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 two from perfect? But should we be surprised? Folks, if you're a Bible believer, no way, folks. You see, if we go back to the beginning, Adam was created perfect, brilliant by God, especially before the fall. There were no mistakes in Adam's DNA. Do you know our DNA today, folks? There are thousands of mutations on mistakes in the DNA showing we're not as good as we used to be, folks. Amen? In fact, if you were born with a hole in the heart, are you evolving better? You need an operation to fix you up, folks. Do you know 1,000 are deadly? 6,000 cause horrible diseases. See, what's happening is genetic entropy. See, the whole creation is breaking down and the DNA is breaking down as well. Now, most people don't realise this, but we're just riding on the back of 4,500 years of accumulated knowledge and inventions that's gone before us. For example, who in New South Wales invented computers? Oh, oh, are we in Queensland now? <laughs> we are too. <laughs> we just did a tour through New South Wales. <laughs> this is what happens, folks, when you get to my age, nearly 78. Okay? <laughs> We're in Queensland, of course we are. It's a little bit warmer here, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, uh, where was I? Anyway, uh, who, in, who in Queensland invented computers, electricity, motor cars, aeroplanes? I can go on and on. Go to university, onto the internet, into the library. Folks, you can learn heaps of stuff, but ju we're just riding on the back of all this accumulated knowledge and inventions that's gone before us. Now, I want to show you something. Have a look at this. Who likes spiders? Let's have a look at this little spider. Of course, the spider learned to do that just by accident. Eh? Isn't that incredible? The creative power of our God. Amen? That's amazing, isn't it? Anyway, uh, you know, spider silk's incredible stuff, folks. Do you know it's 100 times stronger than steel? If you wind spider silk around only as thin as my finger, you can suspend two fully loaded Boeing 737s. Well, how little old spider learn how to do that? Folks, he didn't learn anything. God created a spider to do exactly what the spider does. Amen? And folks, if we go back to Adam, we find that God created him perfect, brilliant, in the image of God. Folks, he was programmed with perfect language, perfect grammar. He didn't have to learn how to talk. And one day God said to Adam, he said, Adam, I want you to name all those animals. Tell me, did Adam have any trouble? I don't know about you guys, but I get to number 10. I've forgotten the first one. I'm praying for the memory of Adam. Next time I'll say Queensland. <laughs> okay. So Noah would certainly have had all the tools, the skill, the technology required to build the ark. And God told him to build this ark out of gopher wood. Do you know there are many interpretations of gopher wood? Some say it's this tree, that tree, another tree, but one of them is actually a process, laminated wood. Folks, can you imagine thick ribs, half a metre thick, thick planks but multi layers, all fitted together with mortise and tenon joints, pinned through with dowels. Folks, the side of Noah's Ark would have been a metre thick like solid plywood. And by the way, do you know this process we can trace back to 2000 BC and was still in use up to the Roman times? Then, of course, uh, God told Noah to pitch it inside and out for waterproofing, but not only that, for protection of the wood. Who's ever seen Mythbusters on TV? I saw this show one day and they're shooting cannonballs at unprotected planks, but they were splintering and breaking apart. And then they coated some other planks with a thick coat of hot pitch. Folks, once it had cooled down, it's amazing how the pitch absorbed so much of the impact. 
incredible, isn't it? So it wasn't just waterproofing, but oh, because Noah's Ark would be bobbing around in the water, bumping into logs and so forth. Anyway, uh, with such a large number of animals going on board, God told Noah to build lots of pens and lots of rooms. Here's just a few of them on what they may have looked like. Now, the ark had to be 300 cubits long. Folks, a cubit is from your elbow, the outstretched middle finger. That's about half a metre on an average sized person. So 300 cubits, 150 metres, three Olympic swimming pools connected end to end. Folks, it's the same size as a World War II aircraft, converted World War II aircraft carrier. Was this a little boat? It was a big ship, wasn't it, folks? Anyway, it was tw- 50 cubits or 25 metres wide, 30 cubits or 15 metres in height. Do you know that's the height of a four to five storey building? Had a cubit window for light and ventilation. Who thinks they need a good ventilation, by the way? Folks, smoke tests have proven. Big shaft right through the middle. Cold air dropping in. Heat from the animals rising. Changing the air all the time. So it's a perfect ventilation system. Anyway, uh, anybody heard of Captain Cook, by the way? This is Captain Cook's ship. Same scale as this one. This is the Endeavour. Now forget the sails and the masts. See, see, see the hole down the bottom? You can fit 54 of these inside of Noah's Ark. Wow. Amazing, isn't it, when you look at that? And uh, Now you notice that Noah's Ark doesn't have a, pro- a propeller, does he? Why is that? Or a sail, a rudder. Folks, it wasn't going anywhere. The whole well was covered in water for up to five months. So, <coughs> and there's no port, by the way, for five months. Now, ships in the past have been built for speed and manoeuvrability to cut through the water and go from Melbourne to Los Angeles. But Noah's Ark was only built for two reasons. Huge capacity and amazing stability. Now, if Noah was just a little guy like me and the cubit only that big, folks, he could hold 522 double-decker rail cars, 240 sheep per car. That's a total of 125,000 sheep. That's not even packed in tight. Folks, if you pack things in tight, you can fit 350,000 of these models inside of Noah's Ark. Now, the stability of Noah's Ark was absolutely incredible. You see, Korean and American naval architects have done extensive tests. What they found is this. Noah's Ark was stable in up to 390 kilometre winds. Folks, 30 metre waves were no problem for Noah's Ark. It's actually proven to be 13 times more stable than the minimum requirements of American shipping. But who designed Noah's Ark, by the way? God did. Folks, and do you know the new oil tankers and oil carriers today? They're now being built more in the shape of Noah's Ark. Yes. Anyway, God told Noah that two of every unclean animal, bird and creepy thing were going on board the ark. Does everybody know the clean ones went in by sevens? Is this news to somebody today? The clean animals went in by sevens. See, in the Old Testament, he used to sacrifice bulls and sheep and goats and that, pointing to the final sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Wasn't that many, but they went in by seven. Now, I get a lot of skeptics coming up to me all the time. I love skeptics, by the way. I get a lot of skeptics coming. They say, right, how could all the hundreds of thousands of breed of animal, how would they ever fit on Noah's Ark? Folks, once again, they never read the Bible. Folks, the Bible is very clear. They went in according to the kind not breed. For example, let's consider the dog kind. Do you know there's hundreds of breed of dog in the world today? Every now and again there's a new breed of dog. Where does that come from? Pretty obvious. Two old breed of dog. Folks, let's go back a hundred years ago. Noah needed a number of breed. Let's go right back to Noah. How many dogs did you need? Two original wolf type dogs. Amen? And of course, uh, <coughs> two, two bears and two uh, kangaroos and of course the clean animals like the sheep went in by seven. And anyway, God, with his great creative ability, folks, he purposed a tremendous variety to adapt to different conditions around the world. It's called natural selection. For example, wolves have adapted to the snow and ice conditions of Canada and Alaska. Tell me, what would happen if your short-haired dog got left up there in the autumn? Freeze to death. He'd be meat for the wolves, wouldn't you? You'd be better off like the dingo adapting to the hot and the warm conditions of Australia. Amen. Now, many people like Charles Darwin. Anybody heard of Charles Darwin? Any, uh, mistakenly interpret this, folks, as evolution. It's simply diversity within God's created kind. And as with a dog kind, the many breeds are due to a loss or thinning out of genetic information. There's no gain in information at all. 
It's always a loss of information. Amen? Anyway, uh, John Woodmap, this guy's an amazing guy. He did a seven, intensive seven-year study of Noah's Ark. He estimated that only 16,000 animals, birds, and creeping things went on board the ark. And you know the medium size of all those animals was that big, folks, about the size of a rat. That's a medium size of 16,000 animals, birds, and creeping things. Do you know only 11% of all the animals were larger than the sheep? Well, the great majority are very tiny. Now, let's assume the very large animals going as babies or juveniles. That makes sense? Folks, if that was the case, they never had to clean up. Who thinks that's a good idea? Do you know in parts of Europe, like northern uh, Sweden, they have animals under the house for up to seven months of the year. It's so cold. And uh, they use a method called deep litter. Wood shavings, peat moss, straw, deep enough, will easily last that seven month which has been proven to last over two years. So there's no, not even any cleaning up required on board of Noah's Ark. Anyway, Noah's now 600 years old when the flood came. Now, Noah built the ark, is that true? But God did two miracles. Anybody know what those miracles were? I'm going to see you're all going to learn something new then. God brought the animals and God shut the door. Then, folks, a tremendous cataclysm happened. See, on the 17th day of the second month, the 600th year of Noah's life, folks, the fountains of the deep burst open all over the world. Can you imagine that? Folks, it was raining and pouring 40 days and 40 nights, earthquakes, volcanoes, all happening simultaneously. The dense ocean floor was now subducting into the mantle. The single pre-flood landmass, folks, was being ripped and torn apart, not slow and gradual as evolution teaches, folks. Rapid, catastrophic plate tectonics are happening now. Amazing things are really happening, folks. And not only were the people, the cities, the animals destroyed, but vast amounts of sediments would have been picked up by the fast-moving waters, laying them down in pancake layers all over the world. Who's seen stuff like that? Do you know the average depth, folks, worldwide of water-laid sediment? 1.6 kilometres deep. Well, the Grand Canyon is an amazing uh, thing. We, we actually went there. We checked it out. What a monument to the flood, folks. Do you know these layers of the Grand Canyon? And many, many different layers, different colours. They run dead straight for hundreds of kilometres, except the Kaiba Bubble. God lifted up the whole plateau. And those layers, folks, 1.2 kilometres thick, bend over each other like soft plasticine. Do you know why? Because they're lifted up while they're still soft and they're still wet. If you don't believe me, try bending your 10 centimetre concrete path. See what happens. Can you imagine 1.2 kilometres deep of hard rock being bent? Shatter, break to pieces. Amen? It would. So it shows you. Anyway, between two of these layers, we find a knife edge difference. And uh, people who believe in millions of years tell us a bottom layer is 10 million years older than the top layer. Folks, this, this is no problem for a creationist. But if anybody here is believing in millions of years, I've got a really good question for you. How come there was no erosion between that knife edge difference for 10 million years? Is that a good question? Yeah. Anyway, uh, anybody ever been to the 12 Apostles down where we live? Hands up if you haven't been. Better hurry up. <laughs> Folks, there's only seven left. Because of erosion in my lifetime. Amen? Amazing. Anyway, I was in England one time. I was watching this documentary. The guy was pointing off the east coast of England. You know what he said? Four and a half kilometres out there used to be a village from the coast. There was a church built 500 years ago, four kilometres from the coast. It's now half a kilometre from the coast. That's seven metres of a ro very soft cliff there and the North Sea's bashing them down year after year after year. Very, very rapidly. Anyway, since then we've visited England several times, folks, and uh, we've investigated the erosion on the east and the south coast. And uh, we've taken hundreds of photos. Look, you have roads leading to nowhere. That seems a bit silly, doesn't it? 
folks, you've got World War II bunkers 200 metres out to sea. That's since my lifetime, folks. I was born at the end of the Second World War. So in my lifetime, these bunkers are now 200 metres out to sea. Amazing erosion. Now, has anybody heard of the White Cliffs in England? Folks, these are really spectacular, amazing cliffs, up to 160 metres high. In 1997, that, that cliff was another 35 metres further out to sea. Now, the people who own this bed and breakfast light, that's are very smart. Folks, they paid engineers £240,000 and, uh, and, and they had the whole of this building put on rollers and they rolled it back a long, long way. But guess what? It's ready to be moved again. Let's go over those hills a few to Berlin Gap. Look at this. See those houses up there, folks? That's in 1930. The front house is way off the sea and you've got houses going way back there. Now, not the front house, but the last house is now, look, right at the end of the cliff. Folks, do you know the people in authority there? They tell me that the average rate of erosion on these cliffs for a long, long time is one metre per annum. Now, England's supposed to be hundreds of millions of years old on the evolution time frame. Well, let's, let's, let's just look at a fraction of that, a fraction of 1%, 1 million years. And let's multiply 1 million years by 1 metre of erosion. Who's good at mass? Folks, that's 1,000 kilometres. Folks, all England would be gone in a few hundred thousand years at the most. So all this nonsense about millions of years, folks, it makes no sense at all when you look at the evidence around the world. Amen? Anyway, cause, and of course we agree with the Bible, don't we? Anyway, anyway uh, with so much evidence of erosion, how come there's no erosion between those layers for 10 million years? Folks, you know, there's a worldwide flood, layer upon layer upon layer. And do you know what you, do you, know what you find between layers? Raindrop impressions. Folks, imagine I've got some soft mud down here. A big raindrop hits it, makes a beautiful little circle. Well, the wind and the sun can destroy them in hours or minutes or at the day, a few days at the most. Between layers, you find perfectly preserved raindrop impressions. So how long was it before the next layer went over the top? No time at all. Worldwide flood was about layer upon layer upon layer, being laid down in an amazing way, wasn't it? Anyway, uh, as the flood waters receding, there's evidence of huge lakes have formed, like these big ones in North America. But do you know the breach of these lakes and the receding flood waters are now believed to have carved out the Grand Canyon and many other features rapidly rather than slow and gradually. But has anybody heard of David Attenborough? He speaks nicely, doesn't he? But does he say the truth? Folks, David Attenborough said the Grand Canyon took 40 million years to carve out. I'll give you some evidence today, folks. It takes nowhere near that time, I tell you. Mount St. Helens in the 1980s, 200 metres of strata was laid down in a very short time. Extremely violent volcanic activity. Mud flows were all happening very rapidly. In fact, look at this. In just a few hours one day, eight metres, thousands of layers laid down very rapidly. Then, folks, the lake that had recently formed in the volcano burst open. This massive mudslide ripped down the mountain. Well, guess what it did? It carved out a 140-scale Grand Canyon. On David Attenborough's time frame, that would have taken a million years. How long did it really take? Folks, one day it wasn't there. The next day it was. Why do you need 40 million for the real one? You don't. All you need is a lot more water, amen, like the worldwide flood of Noah. I don't think any of us here could even comprehend the incredible catastrophic you know, things happening in the time of the flood of Noah. Amen? Who's glad they weren't outside the boat? Well, and by the way, people who believe in millions of years, such as you, Ross, believe it was a local flood. I want to look at the logic of a local flood today, okay? And see if it makes any sense. Why would Noah build a massive ocean liner for a local flood? Why not just migrate over a few hills to safety? Folks, recently an Arctic fox was fitted with a satellite collar. The researchers couldn't believe the incredible distance it travelled in four months from Norway to Canada over the ice. 
So why would Noah spend a hundred years building a massive ocean liner if all he's got to do is gather all the animals and walk for a few months? It makes no... And by the way, God said he'd never flood the earth again, folks. Is that true? If it was a local flood, that's calling God a liar. Because there's been lots of local floods. Folks, this was a worldwide flood. Amen? Anyway, all the mountains were covered, all mankind died. Every land dwelling, every animal, bird and creeping thing died. In fact, every living substance, folks, on the face of the land was wiped off. Only Noah remained alive and those with him on the ark. And you know, the ark floated for an incredible 150 days before coming to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Many months later, Noah sent out the dove. The second time, came back with the olive leaf. See, everything had to dry out, didn't it? All the vegetation regrow, and eventually after 371 days, this wasn't 40 days and 40 nights. Over one year, they were on the ark before they left the ark. Amen? Now, of course, some people come up to me and say, yeah, but Rod, where did all the water go? Can you folks see any water up there? Can you see much water? Folks, the world is... 72% 72% in area water, 28% land. Well, let's pretend. Let's flatten down all the land all over the world. Let's uplift those really deep oceans. Let's make everything dead flat like this floor. Folks, there's enough water to cover the whole world by nearly three kilometres deep. Water's still here. Psalm 104, 5 to 9 tells us, doesn't it? God pushed up the mountains. He pulled down the valleys in the oceans. Pancake layers of strata, folks, were crunched up by the incredible vertical tectonic activity during the end of the flood. That's why the Himalayan mountains are covered in seashell fossils. They weren't there before the flood. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Who, th- who thinks the truth is more interesting? It really is, isn't it? Anyway, God now told them to be fruitful and to multiply. How long does it take for populations to grow? How many people live in the world today? Eight billion. You're learning a lot today, aren't you? Eight billion. Do I look very old? Folks, just before I was born, two billion. Let's go back 350 years ago, half a billion. Folks, if you're a mathematician doing graphs, it's absolutely impossible on a population graph to go back beyond the time of Noah. The Bible tells us, doesn't it, very clear that every person in the whole world is descended from Shem, Ham, Japheth and their wives. Who's happy to be my relation today? Folks, Noah's the great-grandfather of every one of the eight billion in the world today. But of course people say, yeah, but Rod, what about the African people? What about the Aborigine people? What about the Chinese? Folks, there's only one race in the world, is that true? And by the way, we've all got the same colouring in our skin. It's called melanin. It all depends on how little you've got for how light you are, how much you've got for how dark you are. Everything in between. Yeah. And different people can adapt to different places around the world. Of course, uh, that's what happened to the Tower of Babel, isn't it? God got angry with them. Is that true? He split them up into little groups. There was all the genetic makeup to develop all the different people groups that had developed after the Tower of Babel. And by the way, anybody blue-eyed blonde like me? I'm, blue, I'm, uh, I'm blue-eyed grey now. Any <laughs> well, folks, we are very well adapted to northern Europe and northern Russia. Do you know that? Because we'll still get enough vitamin D. But if we were in the tropics, what would happen? Folks, just playing cricket on a Saturday, I've had two skin cancers cut out. You see, different people have adapted to different places. And it really depends on your colouring of your skin in in a big way. Anyway, uh, what's the evidence for a worldwide flood? Anybody think there's any evidence? Folks, billions of fossils showing clear evidence of rapid burial on a massive worldwide scale. In fact, some of the fossil records are so delicate, like insect wings and jellyfish. Do you know they... uh, (coughs) they, in In the tropics and that, they just melt away in just a few weeks. But what do you find? You've got jellyfish perfectly preserved with all the tentacles. Wow. Folks, billions of fish. Who's ever done fishing with a fin sticking up rigid? <laughs> They're buried alive by their billions. If you've done fishing, you know what I mean. Look how fast it gets. He's a, he's a fish just swallowed its breakfast. Wow. How fast was that? 
An extinct ichthyosaur just given birth to its young. Another great evidence of rapid burial are tree fossils. Folks, some of these tree fossils go, go up through 25 metres of strata. Now, on the evolution, this is no problem for a creationist, but if you're an evolutionist, I've got a big question again. Could a tree stand up for a million plus years and not rot away? I don't think so. What happens to a tree when they die? They rot away, insects destroy them, fires, they're all gone in a few decades. Getting back to my example, some of these tree fossils cut through coal seams. Well, folks, how long does it take to make coal? We can turn good wood into coal in just four weeks, folks. You don't need millions of years. In fact, everything that they say takes millions of years can happen very rapidly. Um, now, any of the ladies like opals? Yeah. Well, uh, I picked up this brochure in Katoom. They said that it took millions of years to make this opal. He's a man at Lightning Ridge. Folks, this guy learned the mix. He just mixes up a bit of slurry in his Vegemite jars, plonks them on the, tin, on the shelf in his tin shed. In a few weeks, you've got a beautiful opal. Do you need millions of years for opal? Not really. Who's ever been and seen the stalactites? Once again, we put, uh, at the Wellington Cave, they're telling us they're millions of years old. Folks, here's a mine that was only shut for 55 years. Look at the miners for scale. Look at the size of those. In 55, do you need millions of years for stel stel stalactites? In our back Queensland, they found petrified fence posts. Who's ever been in the museum, checked out the petrified wood? It's always got a tag on, millions of years old. <laughs> Folks, how could fence posts in Australia be millions of years old? Captain Cook didn't come out that longer. <laughs> in Western Australia, there's a water wheel, a wooden water wheel, turned to solid stone. Anyway, in Tasmania, this guy left this beautiful soft felt hat down in the mine. Well, guess what? It's now a hard hat. <laughs> yeah. Folks, you don't need millions of years. Anybody, everybody starting to be convinced that you don't need all these millions of years? Amen? Anyway, uh, dinosaurs went on the ark. Now, a lot of people are asking me about dinosaurs. So everybody here, all ears now about dinosaurs? But tell me, would you take a big one or a little one? I think I'd take a little one, wouldn't you? See, dinosaurs like a crocodile come from an egg. Now, here's a baby crocodile. Even the biggest, by the way, the biggest dinosaur that ever lived came from an egg that big. Didn't have to be very big going on board, was it? But uh, here's a baby crocodile. Any problem with that going on board? What about great-grandma? Would you give her a miss? Yeah. Folks, that's nothing. Look at great-grandpa. See that crocodile, folks? That was shot up in, in 1957 up in Queensland. The jaws, you know the jaws on that crocodile are twice as big as most museum replication of uh, <coughs> T-Rex. Do you know that? There's not one T-Rex jaw been found as big as that crocodile. That's interesting, isn't it? And that was alive just a few years ago, wasn't it? Anyway, in the book of Job, it described this animal called behemoth. And uh, behemoth had a tail like a cedar tree. There's my wife, Nancy. There's two cedar trees. Tell me, if you had a tail like a cedar tree, would you have a big tail or a little tail? I think you'd have a big tail. Folks, I was reading a Bible commentary one day. You know what it said? It was a hippopotamus. Who's ever been to the zoo and seen a hippopotamus with a tail like a cedar tree? Do you know, another one said it was an elephant. Who's ever seen an elephant with a tail like a cedar tree? Yeah. What does it actually look like? Pretty obvious? Dino the dinosaur, isn't it? Folks, when you go back into written history, there are many written accounts of people killing, being killed, describing these monsters. Anybody heard of the Welsh Chronicles? The oldest written history in Britain described this brave king one day went out to save the city. But what happened? Whoa, the monster ate him up like a little fish. But what about St. George? St. George was more successful, is that true? What is St. George actually killing, folks? A dinosaur, isn't it? Dinosaur is just a new name for dragon, right? Isn't it? Anyway, uh, Bishop Bell was buried 500 years ago. On his gravesite is a brass plaque with, two pic with, a, with a picture of two long-necked tailed dinosaurs fighting. See the one with the spikes on the, on the left there? Well, here's the real ones. How could they do that without seeing them? That's interesting, isn't it? In Europe, Nancy and I took several pictures of dragons on ancient buildings. 
Have a look at this. Look at the scales on this one, please. They're exactly like scales of dinosaur scales found in the fossil record. In Asia, uh, on, a, on an 800-year-old temple, you've got a perfect replica of a stegosaurus. Anyway, in Montana and Alaska, they've actually found dinosaur bones that are still soft. They're not mineralized. They're not hard. In fact, they're so, they've got soft, smelly, like tish, stretchy tissue. And they've even found the red blood cell, cells. And when they dig them up, guess what? They stink. Does that tell you anything? It does, doesn't it? Amazing when you think about that, isn't it? Uh, but, you know, of course, uh, people who believe in millions of years tell us that Dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. But folks, and, and also there were uh, multiple ice ages. So the earth went from hot to cold, hot to cold. Anyone believe that stuff could last for 65 million years of hot and cold? No. Not at all, folks. Anyway, this is excellent proof for young earth. But tell me, who believes in Jesus Christ today? Do you really believe everything he says? Folks, when talking about marriage... Uh, Jesus said Adam was at the very beginning of all creation. Now this makes good sense for a young earth and also for true Bible history. Adam at the very beginning of creation. But if you are believing in, say, theistic evolution, gap theory or whatever, and so you tack on 6,000 years of Bible history onto the end of 4.5 billion years of evolution theory, that statement by Jesus Christ now becomes nonsense, doesn't it? Because Adam would be the end. But Jesus, I don't know about you folks, but I'd rather believe Jesus Christ. He made everything, he knows everything. Amen? Than a fallible. Do you know in Colossians 2 verse 8 it says this. It says, beware, make sure that you're not deceived by the teachings of men, the teachings of the world that differ from the teachings of Jesus Christ. Amen? Anyway, why isn't the word dinosaur in the Bible? Folks, it's a new name only invented 170 years ago. The King James Version was translated 400 years ago. You won't find the word dinosaur, but you do find behemoth, don't you? Leviathan, dragon. It's just a different name for the same animal, folks. Well, why have dinosaurs become extinct? Well, folks, straight after the flood, we had a dramatic climate change, you know that? That's when the Ice Age started, built up over 700 years. There's not multiple ice, it's one ice age, folks. Amen? And of course, uh, it wasn't very good for them to live uh, compared to before. Anyway, uh, who, if you went to Tasmania, would you see a Tasmanian tiger? No. Why not? Because we hunted them to extinction. Good job we only killed 99% of the whales. That 1% is now growing up in number. And uh, any, uh, anybody heard of Marco Polo? Marco Polo went through Asia, you know what he said? Tigers are an absolute pest. If you went trekking on a holiday through the same place, would you be worried about tigers? Folks, you'd be lucky to see one with half a dozen guides. And nearly all gone. In New Zealand, the Maori people, they just love Kentucky Fried Moabit. Well, they had too many feasts. And look what happened. They wiped them all out a few hundred years ago. They we, we'll go easy on these New Zealand people. Though, aren't we? <laughs> They're still trying to play rugby, I think, aren't they? <laughs> 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 I think it's about time they. Uh, I, say, I think it's about time they started Aussie rules over there, don't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Anyway, I'm getting off the track here, <laughs> folks. The Bible says we are created in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made. But if you went to university, you did a biology course, what would your professor tell you? He'd tell you very clearly that you've descended from the apes. Let's have a look at a couple, folks. Look at this. Nebraska man, discovered by Harold Cook in the Pliocene deposit of Nebraska. Tremendous amount of literature built on this supposed missing link that supposedly roamed the plains of Nebraska one million years ago. What was the scientific proof? What did they find? One tooth. Folks, if they found your tooth in the car park and drew that picture, would you be happy? <laughs> Does that look like good science? Looks like good imagination to me, amen? Yeah. 
Anyway, I come across this lady many years ago in the Mallee in Northern Victoria. She told me as a Bible believer, she went home from school very sad because her teacher told her she couldn't believe in Adam and Eve. That was just stories. She had to believe in Nebraska man. Well, that little girl was very sad, I tell you. But many years later, she's very happy. You know why? They found a whole skeleton. Guess what it was? A pig. But folks, that was taught in schools and universities worldwide for many, many years. But look at this one, Pill Down Man, discovered by Charles Dawson in a gravel pit in Sussex, England. But I want you to listen to the New York Times headlines. Darwin theory proven to be true, they said. English scientists say the skull found in Sussex, Pill Down Man, now establishes human descent from apes. Folks, this was taught as a fact. Don't believe your Bible and Adam and Eve. Believe in this. Well, folks, after 44 years, a new method to date the bones showed the jawbone had belong, belonged to an ape that died only 50 years previously. But listen to this, folks. The teeth have been filed down on purpose. Teeth and bones have been discoloured with bichromate of potash. It was a fraud. Why? Because they're not finding the missing links, folks. And they'll never, ever find the missing links. Do you know that? Because there's no such thing as missing links. They make up a lot of stories, okay? But you won't find any real science on these things. Anyway, uh, what, what do we actually find in the fossil record? Stasis. No change. You don't find missing links. See, a fish is still a fish. You can go back 50 million years on the evolution time frame. I don't believe those dates, by the way. You'll find a bat. Well, guess what? It's exactly like a bat today. Let's go back 420 million years. You'll find a horseshoe crab. It hasn't changed one bit, folks, from a horseshoe crab today. And you know the reason why? Because all this stuff was laid down 4,500 years ago by the great flood of Noah. Amen? Who'd rather believe God? Amen? Amen. 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 And by the way, Next time, you, you know, now and again, headline. Oh, we found a new missing link. Don't forget, the Piltdown Man was a fraud that deceived hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scientists for 44 years. Well, what can we learn from the account of Noah? Was Noah safe in the ark? Very safe. What about the people outside? Folks, God judged them. Is that true? See, Romans 3.23 tells us that we've all sinned. Hands up if you've never committed a sin. That would be another one. <laughs> we, know, we all know, don't we, folks? But the good news is that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Is that true? Yeah, he died for our sins. So that, uh, look, folks, each, if, if we haven't already done so, and there may be somebody here, we need to repent, turn from our sins, and turn to Jesus Christ. Amen? Because he, the one who hung on that cross was the creator of the universe. He wasn't just a man. And he poured out his own precious blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Amen? Amen. Okay. Well, there was only one door into the ark. How many doors to heaven do you think? I could go on about this, but just one thing. Look. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be. There's only one door into heaven, folks. And that's through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay. Well, who'd like to look inside of Noah's ark? See what it may have looked like. Well, I'll just have a little prayer. For Father, I just pray for each one of us here today. Father God, I pray that just like Noah, I pray each one of us, Lord, would redeem the time for you and that we would reach out to the multitude of people, Father, in this area even, who do not know Jesus Christ. So, Father God, equip us, I pray. Help us to be ready to share the gospel with them in Jesus' name. Well, I'm going to just uh, disappear for a minute and get inside the back. Let's take a walk along the top deck. You can see the individual living quarters of Noah, Ham, Ham and Jacob in the wild. They would have probably lived up here, due to this being an exposition for life and ventilation. We don't really know how the interior was laid out. So what I've done, I've constructed each level with careful thought and imagination just to show you the various things added in the room, giving you an idea of how it may have looked. 
standing here on the top deck, I'm looking down the ramp to the middle left. Further down, we can see another ramp going way down to the bottom left. When I built the model, I want to give people a really good idea of what the real art may have looked like. And so I fitted out each level throughout the art with the various pens and cages and rooms. Over here, we can actually see some of Noah's family enjoying a meal together at the table. Looking further down, we have numerous ball cages with the necessary food supplies being placed close at hand for convenience of feeding. Now, now, the Bible tells us how long the ark was. It tells us how wide and how high. It also describes a single door into the ark, a cubic window for light and ventilation, and also, as we've already mentioned, the three decks inside the ark. It was covered in pitch, that was a resin-like substance, that was there for waterproofing. It also describes rooms in the ark, but it doesn't actually uh, describe the shape and the size of those rooms. What I've done, I've set them out inside the ark to give us an idea of what it would have possibly looked like. Here we are on the top level. Noah and his family would have probably abided here because of the better ventilation and the better light. And over here we can see some decks where they would have recorded the daily activity and many other important records. Winches like this one here were probably used on a day-to-day -day basis to bring up food and water in the daily life of Noah and his family. This is one of the many kinds of babies that house the various kinds of death. As you can imagine, there's just no need for an alarm clock to know that. Food and water would have been stored for convenience next to the animals, as you can see next to these cows that are eating contentedly. Well-preserved food would have been stored conveniently throughout the ark for Noah and his family. Can you just imagine the excitement of Noah as God brought the animals to the ark? Hiking. Do you know ancient people were very good at preserving food? When you think of all the work they had to do, running around the ark, feeding all the animals, they needed a healthy and substantial diet. In fact, before I continue the tour of the ark, I'm just going to have a cup of tea myself. That's not a bad cup of tea, Jim. <laughs> Standing here on the middle level of the mine, down here we can see the lower levels, and over here we can see the pen film way back to the end of the ark. Must have been amazingly big. Just amazing when you get inside the ark to see how big it was, how long it is. We're in the middle of the ark and it seems to be miles down to the other end of the ark. It's just enormous. As I said earlier, the model took hundreds of hours to complete. Just imagine the amount of work that would have been done on the real ark. See, we're now down here on the lower left. Our eyes need to adjust to the filtered light coming through. Probably the larger animals would have been housed over here, together with those that like the filtered light. Standing here in the heart of the vessel. Now I hope that this tour of the model has given you some idea of what the real Noah's Ark may have looked like. And it's taken about 600 hours to put this model together. Many of the parts were very small, needed tweezers to put them together. And so I just hope that uh, this model has given you some idea of the real size and the enormity of the real Noah's Ark. Rob, this has been a fascinating subject and I've learned a lot about Noah's Ark. Oh, squeeze in there, I tell you. <laughs> tell me, folks, who believes we're living in different days? I'm 77 now. Anybody about my age? But do you think things were different when you were a teenager? Folks, I've been to many country shows, and I tell you, I've had hundreds of teenagers come up to me, and do you know what a lot of them say after talking with them? They say, 
because they tell me they come from apes. That's what they're taught at school. But after a few minutes, they say, thanks, mate, I've never heard that before in my life. Folks, not only teenagers, you've got three generations, probably going on four now, that have never been to church. Folks, so any prospects out there for your church? Thousands, isn't there? Folks, and especially if you can get hold of this stuff, I tell you, you can start talking with these people and, uh, and uh, show them a few things, amen? Anyway, uh, who believes we need answers for all these people? Well, one way to get answers is Creation Magazine. For, hands up if you get Creation Magazine. Yeah, good. Folks, this is a fantastic. You know, it was started by an Adelaide doctor in the 1970s. Now it goes to 110 countries worldwide. Folks, it's written by scientists but in layman's terms. Brilliant short articles to really equip you and answer all your questions. It's also a beautiful illustrated full colour magazine with no ads. And it's got a beautiful children's section as well, folks. And it's a real, I tell you what, I was pulling into a New South Wales town one time and this guy waved me down. So I pulled over. He said, right, I've got to tell you this. He said, right, I was in a doctor's surgery a few years ago. I picked up a creation magazine. It turned my life to Christ. There's another man in Gympie. He told me that he'd come to Christ through Creation Magazine. He sent five <coughs> gift copies to his brothers and sisters. Four of them have come to know Christ, folks. Just through Creation Magazine. Because so many people have been hoodwinked by the evolution tale, haven't they? Really, when you think about it. Anyway, uh, you can, if anybody signs up today for the Creation Magazine, it's only $32 for a year subscription. But what if I gave you $35 worth of freebies? Would that help? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, folks, I'm going to give you a back copy of the magazine. You can take that with you straight away. Okay? I'm also going to give you a nice picture of Noah's Ark. Put it up in the kitchen, invite your neighbours in. You get one of those for free. I'm also going to give you a, a little model of Noah's Ark, cardboard model. A man came up to me one time, he said, Rod, I could never talk to my brother about God. He said, every time I did, my brother walked away. But one day, his brother was over for tea. This was sitting on top of the TV set. His brother picked it up, opened up for the first time in his life. Just through the information on that little model. You get that for free. And then we're going to give you a world timeline, folks. This is a timeline of the true history of the world. We just got an email just last week or the week before from, the, from uh, England and they said the British Museum is interested in putting this out in the museum. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Folks, you get that for free too. Put that up in the kitchen and invite your neighbours up. Amen? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to give you a, a free DVD. Look, we've, we've had feedback from people who got the DVD, lend it to a friend, and the friends come to Christ. Yeah. So you get, you can be an evangelist with this stuff. Just giving it out, lending it, and so forth. And we're also going to give you a children's storybook as well. This has got that big uh, crocodile in too. Quite interesting, isn't it? Now, if you want to sign up, folks, for three years, right? It's $85. We reduce the yearly price. But also, you can pick another $18 DVD, a $15 DVD of your choice, okay? If you do that. So I just encourage you to, to, to uh, do that. Anybody heard of Richard Dawkins, by the way? I was in England on, on this tour, and a guy came up to me earlier too. He said, Rod, do you know that you're on Richard Dawkins' website? I said, Really? He had 17 pages printed off, the, off, off Dawkins' website. On the first page he'd had, Ark Man Visits UK, Skeptics Required, Urgent Action. <laughs> and then 15 pages of blogs. Folks, were they out to get me, I tell you, you know. And the language was bad. Oh. Yes. And then on the last page, Richard Dawkins put all my itinerary up for the English tour. Folks, you should have seen the crowds. We, I'm not kidding, folks. In London, we had massive venues packed to the hilt. People standing around the edge and everything. Now, he meant it for bad, but what did God do? He, I couldn't have had better advertising, like I say, on the front page of the London newspaper. 
So God, God can do amazing things, can't he? But, but I've got a question. If Richard Dawkins thinks it's a, a good idea to stop this stuff, does anybody like me think it's a good idea to get it out? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And uh, anybody ever watch TV or heard on the radio like God doesn't exist? Do you get annoyed with that? Yes. Folks, this is one little way that you can bring glory back to God for his amazing creation. Amen? Because once you've read it, pass it on. You never know what's going to happen, do you? Just like that guy who was in the doctor's surgery and so forth. So I just encourage you with that. Um, now, we've got some books. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you can pay cash, credit card or check, okay? Anybody still have checks? Not many have checks anymore, do they? But you can pay cash, credit card or check. F plus, F plus, credit, uh, and uh, yeah. And, uh, and by the way, folks, Maybe there's somebody here who uh, can't afford this. There's, I think a lot of people are going through a hard time. Is that true? In Australia. Folks, I'll give away one free subscription. If you are that person, you can't afford it, come and see me and I'll give away one. I can only give away one. I haven't got enough money to give away more than one. Okay? So thank you very much. Now, uh, we've got some great books over there. Then you're going to put some on. Evolution's a kit. This is a DVD. 15 PhC D scientists, folks, explain evolution's fatal flaws. If you want to lend something good out, well, watch it first and then lend it out. Have a look at this one. Who believes they should have the answers book? Folks, you can go to university, earn millions of dollars, but what will it mean in, in eternity? Maybe nothing. But if you learn all the answers in the answers book, you turn a few people to Christ, how long does that last? That's eternal value, isn't it? You know, I, I was at a country show one day in Gundawindi, and this lady came up to me, she said, Rod, she said, uh, I bet you can't answer my question. And she rattled off all the ministers in town, she, nobody could answer a question. I'll bet you $10,000 you can't answer my question. Well, I'm wondering what the question is. Well, folks, I said, what's your question? She said, who was Cain's wife? Before she could blink, I gave her the answer. Folks, who believes that we should have answers to these things? I, by the way, I led her off the 10 grand because she nearly died of a heart attack. But we need answers. 60 of the most asked questions. Now, who'd like the answers book for free? Or buy the pack. Because you pay for two and you get the answers book for free. Is that good? Amen. Now, this is a great book here, The Genesis Account, Theological, Historical, Scientific Commentary on Genesis 1 to 11. I've seen this guy play 44 people simultaneously at chess, but they never existed. I once saw him play 12 people blindfolded, but they didn't exist. Folks, this guy's a brilliant man. If you want every answer, right, to the historical, theological, right, <coughs> and scientific answers to Genesis 1 to 11, this is the book for you. Amen? Amen. And we'll be able to answer a lot of questions. What's, now th these are great books. Exploring Geology with Mr. Hibb. There's also Exploring Dinosaurs with Mr. Hibb. Now, these books are made for children. But I guarantee every person in this room would learn so much reading these books. They're not only good for kids, they're good for adults as well. Amen? And who thinks we should have a good Noah's Ark story? Folks, this is not, a good, not only a good Noah's Ark but for children, it's also a great coffee table book. Beautifully illustrated. Put it on the coffee table, have that on the wall, invite your neighbours in for a cup of coffee. <laughs> now you've got all the answers, haven't you? And the lamb, this, this lamb is an amazing book, folks. Do you know, a few years ago now, I gave, Nancy and I gave this book to a friend of ours, daughter. I never heard any more for a while. Then a few years later, the mother rang us and said, Rod, my daughter was reading that book to her daughter, the little girl. And my daughter's now come to Christ reading the Lamb. So there's a lot of good stuff out there, folks. And, and uh, here's, a, here's a five books for $45. Look at that. You know, if you're a grandmother or something, well... Isn't it a good way to get a few books when the birthdays come up and so forth? 
You got any more love or that's it? Oh, dino. And of course, everybody should have a dino. Book. Because this is what they use in schools to teach your kids about millions of years, folks. Your kids need to know the truth about dinosaurs. Amen? We really do. Okay. Well, after the talk, uh, um, I'm going to hand back to Shane. Yeah? But if you've got any questions, come up and see. I'm happy to be here for a long time. Folks, I, I, I remember in one meeting in England, I, I was behind the ark for three hours one night answering questions, especially to all those sceptics that come through, you know, Richard Dawkins. So uh, just encourage you, come up and, and uh, ask a few questions. And uh, don't... Uh, uh, Shan, just hand back to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's great. That's really good. Who enjoyed that? Uh, I encourage you to go outside and, and buy some merch, buy some product. Uh, thank you, Rod and Nancy, for coming out. Really appreciate you guys. And, and please uh, bring all your best questions. And uh, we'll, we'll give you 10 or $20 if you can ask them a question and stump them. Okay? So, <laughs> so that's our challenge to you this morning. If I so, them all, I get $20. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> And you get a free T-bone as well. So uh, it's so good to have you come out with us. Uh, we're going to play one song to finish off. One song. So we'll do that. Uh, as always, service is, is finished now. But if you want to stay back for some praise and worship, we've got one song that we'll do. We'll do that first song. That first song. I know who I am. So if you'd like to stand up. Uh, also, as we get...